Hello and welcome to Africa Today. I am Esther Mokwariola. For a region often viewed from a global perspective of misconceptions, assumptions and stereotypes, the Africa in recent years have largely been labelled as a war-torn, unstable and impoverished continent. Beyond the bias of an inaccurate single story are facts that indicate a continent on the move, with commendable resilience and limitless potentials in people, places and processes. And so we ask, what are your thoughts on collective efforts aimed at redefining the continent and boosting Africa's global perception? You can join the conversation and share your thoughts with us on Twitter at TVC News NG. We'll take a report now and Africa Today will be right back. Welcome on board. South Africa is said to be one of the most beautiful countries in the world, owing to its natural landscape. Since the fall of apartheid in 1994, more visitors are discovering her changing and breathtaking scenery. South Africa's scenic beauty, magnificent outdoors and cultural diversity have made it one of the world's fastest growing leisure and business travel destinations in the world. Despite tough global economic conditions, tourism grew in 2011 with 8.3 million international tourists and has continued to make a record-breaking growth. The country has earmarked tourism as a key sector with excellent potential for growth as the government aims to increase tourism's contribution, both direct and indirectly, from the 2009 baseline of 189.4 billion rand, that's $11 billion, and 7.9% of GDP, to 499 billion rand. Tourism also supports one in every 12 jobs in South Africa. South Africa is a popular destination for business travelers who spend an average three times more than their leisure counterparts while crossing over significantly into leisure travel themselves through tours before or after their business activities and through return trips in subsequent years. With its first world infrastructure, soothing climate and breathtaking scenery, a virtual app will even take you closer to that destination. Depending on the kind of business you are, uh, visual information is increasingly important. So making sure that you've got great visuals of your business, whether it's a photograph or even video, I think can be a really useful tool to give people the, the right impression of the kind of business that you are. And what we've done is we've put all these images in one place so that you can have a full South African experience, which we've called the Zanzi experience. Welcome back. Africa remains a highly misunderstood region that covers about 6% of the Earth's surface and more than 1 billion of the world's population calls it home. Now, from the fallacy that Africa is a country to the assumption that everyone in the region is poor, the continent has been the target of unfathomable, unfathomable amount of stereotyping and false information in the last few decades. Well, joining me in the studio on Africa today, I have Yomi Badejo Okunsoya, President, African Public Relations Association, APRA. Thank you very much. For Thank you, Esther, for having me. On Africa today. So now let's begin with um, this uh, perception, you know, the general belief that Africa isn't doing so well, that Africa has a lot of poor countries in it, that Africa is not is the least when you talk about being among, you know, among other continents in the world. How can we change this perception? What are your thoughts on levels at which we as a people are going to change the perception that we've had over the years? Uh, well, um, like you said, Africa, there's a lot of stereotyping when it comes to Africa. And you realize that in terms of global communication or what I call global media, uh, the effort has been to portray it as 
you know, the backward country. You know, you hear things like the dark continent. And I think it stemmed from way back where we had issues of slavery, we had issues of colonialism, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so what Western media, for instance, will show you about Africa will be the uh, images of pestilence, of famine, of war, of strife, uh, of incompetence, uh, governance, and so on and so forth. Why has that been so? I think that um, it is something that, you know, uh, they grew up with. Mm. Uh, it's something that has been ingrained uh, with the belief that Africa uh, is not as bright as the other continents of the world. Mm. And therefore, uh, they needed to be, they need to be treated in some subservient way or manner. Uh, and I think that I believe that over the years this has concretized and that is where we are now. And, and talking about where we are now, do you think that there's a possibility of this perception to go away anytime soon? Well, we've got to deal with it. It's not, I, I think so far, attention hasn't been paid for to bring together a strategic wholesome approach in resolving this. What we've had so far, piecemeal, and I'm sure in the course of this program we'll be able to give a few examples of some effort that have been made, but it's not wholesome. So what are the efforts being, being done in terms of you well, know, changing? Well, I, I, I know that, it, it, well, let's start with, for instance, your uh, organization, right. like TVC, mm. uh, countering the, uh, what we call uh, the stereotyping of Western media. Uh, I first came across your station, believe it or not, um, while I was on a trip to the UK and, you know, switching channels many years ago. And I said, oh, what a lovely channel. And I, I, I liked the kind of stories that were being told about Africa. Mm. So that's one. That's one. We, we need to control the voice that is co it's going out of Africa. Right. We need to own the voice, or let me put it like that, we need to own the voice. Mm. Um, so until the fact, when you have a, a, a channel such as yours, or a station such as yours, mm. commanding global viewership, like mm. perhaps CNN or BBC or Sky, uh, it would be a place to start. Mm. Um, I don't know how much of viewership that you are able to command across the globe, uh, and then there are other aspects of it. Uh, there are issues of governance. Um, there are issues of um, narrating the story positively. Um, for instance, we've got tools that we can use. Uh, let me say in Nigeria, we've got um, Nollywood. Yes. How do we use Nollywood to project Nigeria or Africa? Let me look at that. Uh, and uh, perhaps let me just step back a bit also. I think the African Union has a major role to play in this. Of course. Uh, they, they've been talking about infrastructure development, talking about improving governance, talking about peer review, but the greatest challenge that Africa has is its image, mm -hmm. its perception, mm -hmm. because then uh, it affects every other thing. People believe that it's a risky place to do business, mm -hmm. it's a risky place to invest, and uh, it increases the kind of um, or the returns or the interest yeah, and, on the in, I, investment that comes here. Yeah, and talking about the image now, which you mentioned, which is also key to what we're discussing here, the, the, the contribution of other African countries. You know, we have some countries that have not, you know, make the, the um, delectable uh, good news for some, you know, True. one or two reasons, True. you know. True. So what can we do or what level of um, commitment is being put forward to change this narrative because it's more like most African countries are not ready to give up the negatives that has been known that has been known for them over the years. Well, I, I think we still have a challenge with governance in Africa, and you know, large uh, parts of Africa do not practice what you know. Let me put at least general terms is known as democracy. There are issues. There are wars. Um, sometimes it's difficult for an incumbent to be pushed out of office. We have uh, perhaps some of the longest rulers yeah. in, on the globe here in, in Africa. Africa. Mm. And even when they do leave, 
um, they it's skin their sons or their relatives. Mm. Um, you know, they put them in, in place. Mm. So uh, basically, if the world has said that the uh, benchmark is democracy, we must be able to practice it in some form that puts us or pitches us uh, well or com most competitively against other parts of uh, the world. Mm. Um, the truth of the matter is that the investment dollar doesn't know color nor creed. It's just mm. looking for returns. Mm -hmm. And part of the things that can blight returns is risk. So if uh, the investment dollar thinks that there's a high risk in a certain part of the world, um, it wouldn't go there. Or if it goes there, it would demand a premium to go there. Mm. Um, so one of the things we've got to do is that greatly, and I, like I said, from the African Union uh, at the helm of affairs, there must be a strategic approach to dealing with the issue of Africa's perception. Mm. Uh, there's no point talking about the economy. There's no talk, point talking about infrastructure development. There's no point talking about um, business in Africa if the perception of Africa is not right. Yeah, indeed. And then let's quickly go on a short break. You're watching Africa Today, and we've been looking at efforts aimed at redefining the continent and boosting Africa's global perception. We'll continue on this discussion after this. Inaugurated in 1975 in Nairobi, Kenya, the African Public Relations Association set out to foster unity through interaction and exchange of ideas among public relations practitioners in Africa. Now, through communications, the group says it also aims to promote social, political and economic integration on the continent. So, Yomi, how do you intend to do that when we have a continent? that has lots of countries known to be poor, known to have corrupt leaders, known to not do anything good for its people. Okay, first and foremost, what we've done is that we've aligned ourselves with the African Union. All right. And um, we've, we, we, we have registered to become a, con a consultative body to the African Union. And basically, what we'd like to do is that we'd like to influence uh, things that go into the summit of heads of government meeting, which is held twice a year. So we're looking for, we're seeking a seat at those meetings. Okay. And preceding those meetings are a couple of others where you have of the foreign ministers or you have of the directors. So we'd like to influence what goes in there okay. so that at the highest of level, we can have a common vision uh, and a common purpose. So we can put the image of Africa on the agenda. Now, secondly, we must also let them know that there are certain actions or inactions that are taking that ultimately affect the image and oh, the progress yeah. of Africa. Mm. Uh, and we'll be able to highlight those in, you know, in, in real time. Mm. So let's take things like corruption. Mm. Let's take things like uh, poor governance. Let's take things like, uh, you know, uh, accountable governance and so on and so forth. Let's take things like infrastructure development. Let's look at things like um, uh, uh, um, what we talk about, the common... Uh, re reducing the barriers. Yeah. All right. I'll give you a typical example. We're going to Botswana in another four weeks for our annual conference. And it's taking me, a Nigerian, in my position as the president of the African Public Relations Association, over six weeks to obtain a visa to go into Botswana. <laughs> Why is that? Ask me. I'm an African. It's easier for somebody who has a Canadian visa, that has a British visa, to that has an American Botswana. visa to get into Botswana than me. It's taken me over six weeks and I still do not have the visa. So is it more yet. of an African relationship thing? It here? is because there are these barriers that do not allow us to work seamlessly. And the truth of the matter is that if we had a common market in Africa, it can be bigger than Europe. It not it can it will be bigger than Europe, mm. all right? Um, maybe rival the United States of America, but we have these borders, so we've created all these artificial borders for ourselves. So it's not it's not easy for me to trade in Botswana. Mm. I can't get up now and say I'd like I to go to and trade. do business or partner with somebody in Botswana. In Botswana. Mm. There are few African countries that I can tender my passport as a Nigerian and they would give me visa at 
the border mm. at the port. Mm. And I'm African. But compare that to what is happening. Let's look at the United States of uh, America. It's, a, it's an amalgamation of different states. A state in America, take for instance California, is bigger than many countries. So what has happened is that those barriers have gone down and they can do a lot of intertrade. There can be uh, exchange of ideas. So why can't I work in Botswana? Why, if I'm looking for human capital, why can't I go to Botswana and bring that human capital here into Nigeria? So one of the things we've got to do is that we've got to take down those barriers. We've got to be able to seamlessly uh, uh, interact and yeah. trade between mm. the nation states of Africa. Now, not talking about intra-Africa trade, which has been touted as a much needed solution for Africa, which you rightly pointed out, what do you think are some of these challenges now that you know, in intends to inhibit this uh, free single currency, you know, and also visa-free movement and other things that even though might be beneficial to the African continent, what other challenges do you think can be upheaval or can cause, can be a stumbling block to this? Uh, well, I, I, I think a, 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 an understanding of how it works and acceptance. So let me give you an example of, we talk about um, ECOWAS now, and we have a free trade, uh, we have a tariff that's supposed to go across uh, I, I, the west coast of Africa. Right. So technically, if you produce goods in Nigeria, you're supposed to be able to take it all the way down to Ivory Coast, to Senegal, to, you know, on that corridor, you're supposed to be able to get without, um, uh, uh, it's Any called Common External Tariff. Okay. I think that's what yeah. it is, CET. And so you're supposed to do that, but is that really happening? No. So I had a client who opened a factory here in Ibada, in Nigeria, and the whole idea was that they were going to trade across the corridors of uh, 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 the West Coast. Mm. But you've got barriers. So let me give you one of the challenges we have. Take, for instance, the value-added tax. We have, uh, there are different levels in the different states of ECOWAS. So right. where you have maybe 5% somewhere, you've got 17% somewhere, you've got 15%. Technically, Nigeria is the lowest mm. when we talk about the value-added tax. So how do you do that? So um, because we've got the benefit of um, uh, oil, so perhaps we can afford to lower our uh, VAT. And, but the other countries who are going as high as 17.5, how does that work? So can I produce something here where I pay 5% VAT and then I go and sell it in a country, a country where, where they're paying 17.5% VAT? Mm -hmm. you know, and I've said that there's a common external tariff that covers my, my own, own uh, uh, production. So there are those challenges. They need to be brought down. We need to um, for harmonize laws. We need to harmonize policies. We need to harmonize taxation. And how can we do that? Well, I, I think recently we all talked about the uh, CFTA. You all know about that. Uh, at the last minute, Nigeria yeah, the, did pull out yeah. or, or, or of it. But the whole I mean, essence in Rwanda, of it, sorry. Yes, yeah, the whole ahead. essence of it was um, the Continental Free Trade Agreement was part. There are many aspects of it, and part of the aspect, one of the aspects is that we needed to harmonize taxation. We needed to um, uh, 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 defend our borders. Uh, another challenge, let me take it quickly, like for instance, Morocco joining the ECOWAS. Nigeria is against that because uh, there can be some competitive advantage to, for Morocco hmm. being where it is. So uh, the fear is that Nigeria can become a dumping ground or Nigeria that it, it wields very, a lot of influence uh, in ECOWAS may lose that if you bring in uh, Morocco. Morocco. Um, so we, we must have uh, a common platform to be able to deal with those things. We must be able to see the uh, uh, longer picture, uh, the, the, the bigger picture. And what is that bigger picture? That some of us have to um, surrender uh, some of our authority yeah. so that we can create a bigger authority along the lines of the European mm. Union. Mm. Now, let's look at uh, making Africa proud through individual effort or good governance. Who are the people or the countries that readily, readily comes to your mind? Well, I, I, I mean, I, I don't <laughs> think there's a lot of argument if we look at that. Really? Uh, one of the greatest icons we have of Africa, or we had, is uh, Nelson Mandela. Uh, and on many fronts, mm. uh, the most remarkable thing for me was a video where I watched him and he actually called the Queen of England, the sovereign Queen of England, by her first name, 
Elizabeth. I'm not sure anybody has done that. Has done that in a long time publicly, and she was beaming. I mean, uh, uh, when, the, when he died, you saw what the happened. Respect the, and you know, honor the given respect to him. and honor and all that. So he's done very well for Africa, mm. and I think that um, we wish we had him for a much longer time. Perhaps he would have been able to help us. I think he was he was one of our greatest ambassadors. I'll talk about Mo Ibrahim, who is pursuing governance in Africa. Uh, and saying, uh, this is a gentleman that has made so much money, and yet he said to himself that I'm committing myself to improving the, uh, uh, the level of in governance Africa. in Africa. Mm. Um, there are many other people uh, that, you know, we, I would look on as mentors. Um, some of them are here. I think uh, Alaji Aliko Dangote is doing very well right. in terms of entrepreneurship, in terms of building industries. Um, people like him would have taken their money and stashed abroad in mm. different banks, but he's developing Africa. I don't know how many businesses, if he has any at all outside Africa, I think he's a model. And then I'll talk about the likes of the uh, Tony Lumelu, you know, promoting entrepreneurship and so on. And then there are many people across Africa uh, that are really, really doing well. Mm. And, that and aside from them, what about the countries? Because I know oh, South yes, Africa did might ask come to about mind. The country, yes. What um, about the countries? Right now, in terms of indices, Botswana is doing very well. Botswana right. is number one. So um, what you used to measure Botswana? What, what's, uh, in what's terms of um, indices, indices of uh, ease of doing business, yeah. in terms of um, good governance, uh, you know that after 10 years, only last week, uh, the president, the former president, uh, after 10 years, uh, voluntarily stepped down from office uh, and handed over to someone else, even though the elections are not due till next year. Mm. I mean, this is unheard of. Unprecedented. When, when, when we talk about third, fourth term, Sit light presidents. Leaders. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so Botswana, in terms of stability, in terms of the economy, it's, uh, uh, its mainstay is diamond, uh, but it's doing very well. The latest indices, indices uh, global ranking, it's, the top, it's top in Africa. And then there's one more thing we must talk about, which is uh, uh, bedeviling Africa, which is corruption. Yeah. And uh, the least uh, amount of corruption has been recorded in Botswana, and that makes it one of the top, mm. top countries. In fact, not one is the top country uh, in terms of advancement. Well, next to that, do we have any other country, you know, can we talk about? Um, can we talk about? Rwanda. Rwanda is doing very well. Uh, in the latest ranking, Rwanda is the most improved country in Africa. Uh, we're talking about in 20 years ago, and we, just 20 years ago, we're talking about war, uh, we're talking about uh, uh, um, genocide, and it's turned itself completely around. It's like the jewel of Africa. Mm. Uh, I believe if um, uh, Botswana is the hidden uh, jewel of Africa, the uh, Rwanda is the celebrated jewel of Africa. Mm. Um, Kigali is the fastest growing, uh, one of the fastest growing cities uh, I believe not even in Africa, but uh, sub-Saharan Africa definitely, and I believe even in the world, there's a whole lot of stuff going on there. Uh, they turned it around. They've done very well uh, for themselves. Mm -hmm. And then some of those smaller countries, countries uh, well. in the southern hem of Africa, they seem to be doing a lot better than we are doing. Uh, perhaps in the central area of Africa mm. and West. Mm. And we hope that we, the other parts of Africa as well get to we'll catch up, do yeah. much better yeah, and of yes. course be an enviable destination that's for right. most uh, tourists and of course people from around the world. Yeah, uh, thank right. you very much, uh, Yomi Badejo Okunsoya, President, African Public Relations Association, APRA. We appreciate your time with us on the program. Thank you, Esther, for having me. For a continent on the path of rebirth and recovery, Africa remains a region of the world where the hope of the future looks bigger than the shadows of the past. Shutting down stereotypes and writing a new narrative means abundant resources must match efficient resourcefulness to ensure a solid foundation for sustainable development across Africa. Well, that is our package for today, but don't forget to join the conversation as usual on Twitter at TVC News NG and follow me for updates around Africa at Esther TVC News. Until the next one, I am Esther Amokwariola and always remember, Africa can only get better. Thank you.